All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer as we begin tonight. Dear Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to meet, and certainly little EJ, after all that time in the hospital, and us watching and praying for him, and he's able to go home, and we know he still has continual health needs, but it's a great rejoicing. It's a testimony of your power, and we praise you for that. We ask for a healing for Brittany as well, being in the emergency room. And Lord, we know that as we come here tonight, there's all sorts of concerns and requests that we have, and uh, pray for people that are traveling tonight and, and people that need healing and health and wholeness that you'd intercede. We know that your Holy Spirit meets us right where we are. We thank you that you give strength and power to your people. It says in Psalm 28 that you are a shepherd and you carry us. What a great truth and reassurance that we can have every day. Thank you for your word and thank you for your love and compassion and care for all of us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, we're in Revelation 16 if you want to turn, but I got a little bit of a, leads us into the topic tonight. Between, I would say, Christmas and February, on all the sports channels, there are going to be games called what? Bowl games, all sorts of bowl games. Now, you may be a very avid sports fan or a mild sports fan or you don't like sports at all. But there will be bowl games, and there are more bowl games than you can have on a smorgasbord at a luncheon. They used to name them after uh, flowers and, and uh, fruit, and now they're named after all sorts of things. But bowl games of college football. And uh, by the way, in the professional sports, it used to be in January, but now they keep pushing everything out. And in February, there'll be the ultimate one called what? The Super Bowl, right? And again, you may... May not, may not even be aware of who's going to play in it or even care who's playing in it, but I guarantee you, uh, there are some churches that are so into it, they will actually, you know, revolve services so they can watch the Super Bowl, have events about that. So it's amazing when you stop and think about that. Um, and I, I found it interesting. I was thinking about this. I'm going to just use the men tonight, and I could, with men and their special interest, I, I, could, I could take time with women on that too, but I won't for the sake of time. But I thought about men and their special interests, because when I grew up in a church uh, a while back up north, it was near Chicago. So, of course, the men and the boys were all into, you know, the, the teams that were there, the Chicago White Sox and Cubs and baseball. And, of course, the Bulls weren't good then, but who made it great in it later on? Michael Jordan and then the Bears in football. Of course, it was people came in so the, into that town, so they had all their sorts of professional teams that they love and were attributed to. Of course, if you move to a college town like I did for college or even here, then the, the shift is to college sports. So we, East Carolina and the Tar Heels and the Wolfpack and on you go. So that's the interest of some churches are really into sports. Other churches I've been at, particularly like in the Nashville, Tennessee area where there's a music thing, a lot of churches are in, and women too, are into the arts and music. And a lot of the church special interest I was around the arts and uh, music. And then I've been in some churches where the interest is politics. And I mean, in the old days before you had internet, if you didn't get it in the newspaper or you didn't watch it on the news, don't worry, you'll hear about it in church. When the elders and the deacons pray, they'll talk all about it, they'll complain about it, it will come forth in their prayers. And if you missed it there, the pastor will stand up and do a 15 minute diatribe political commentary on the politics of the day. So, and, and that's kind of, a, I'm doing that tongue in cheek, but I know there are some churches in town that are very advocate in that. And there's some pastors that actually, I know will go to the Capitol and pray for our politicians, and they'll have special days of prayer with the politicians, that's a good thing. But uh, if I was to characterize the men in a general way of Arthur, I don't think it's really around sports, I don't think it's really around politics, you know what I think it is? Fishing and hunting, is that not true? <laughs> is that not true for you guys? Arthur is characterized by fishing and hunting, and, if you, and I used to read Field and Stream magazine, so you, you can't necessarily say that's not a sport either. But I can relate, because when I went to seminary in the Pocono Mountains of Pennsylvania, the guys were really into fishing and hunting. And I learned a lot. There was only a certain time that you could hunt up there. And man, the, the bucks were big up there. And I found out because in, in those days, we had one car, and Lisa worked a night shift as a nurse. So often I had to, if the weather permitted, I would ride my bike. And man, it was uphill and uphill and uphill in the mountains. I had my little three-speed bike I inherited from my grandfather. A lot of times I had to ride in a suit 
believe it or not. I rode on my bike in a suit, and before I'd even get up to the school, lo and behold, the high school bus would drive up, and they were sitting there, oh, here's that funny dude in the suit, and they'd roll down windows, and some of them throw spitballs at me, and I had to endure all that stuff. But I did take one night class in the brutal cold of winter. It was like the frozen tundra up there. But there was a guy, who was a good friend of mine. He had a very old car. Since I didn't have a way really to get there at night because Lisa's working, he volunteered to pick me up. So we did that, but one cold night we were on the way and sure enough, a big old buck jumped out, bam, right in the side right where I was. It's amazing the car made it to the seminary, but that's where the car ended up. <laughs> that poor guy was so poor. Seminary students don't have a lot of money. That guy did not have money to get a car for the next two years. He had to walk to class after that. But man, the deer up there were big. So I can relate to that. Uh, if that's your, I was hearing somebody talk about squirrel stew tonight. So I know that's, this is the interest of Arthur Christian, no doubt about it. But I can relate to that. By the way, as we're moving into that, I thought of three guys in the scripture that exemplify that. Paul was the sportsman. He loved to use sports illustration. If there was televised sports, he'd be at it. I'm telling you. He, liked, he talked about politics, but his real interest, man, he was a sports fan. And then John, although he grew up as a fisherman, you know what John's interest was? Politics. Read his little epistles, it's all in there. No wonder God used John to write about God's final government and the final governments of man. And of course, Peter, was, he was your fishing and camping man, right? He talked about pitching the tent and there we go. So all three of those guys represent the special interest groups of the church. But I wanna go back to the bowl because we're gonna talk about God's bowls tonight and it's far different than college football bowls, and the final bowl is going to be played on a field far bigger than any football or soccer field. We're going to talk about that final battle tonight, and I've seen a lot of bowl games where, and some of you were officiating, so I'm not downgrading you, but I've seen some bad officiating at games and poor calls. God's not going to call, be called into question by anybody. He's in the right. He doesn't answer to anybody. And he's in charge of what's going on with these bowls that we're going to see tonight. So let's go back to Revelation 16 and talk about a far different bowl than the bowls of college football. And as you're turning back, and so I was a sports fan, and so I had to endure in high school. If my team lost, I knew if I was going to go back to school, I was going to get teased to the hilt about my team losing. Later on, I, I had a lot of friends that actually had no interest in sports. They never played sports, had no interest whatsoever. It was probably for my betterment in that regard. But follow with me now in Revelation 16. I'm reading the first 12 verses, then we're going to go through the outline. Follow along. And I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, go and pour out the seven bowls of the wrath of God into the earth. And the first, it's always understood here, the angel, and the first went and poured out his bowl onto the earth. And it became a loathsome and malignant sore upon the men who had the mark of the beast, and notice who worshiped the beast. Verse three, and the second poured out his bowl into the sea, and it became blood like that of a dead man, and every living thing in the sea died. And the third poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters saying, Righteous art thou who art and wast, O holy one, because thou didst judge these things. And they poured out the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink. They are worthy of it. Verse 7, And I heard the altar saying, Yes, O Lord God, the Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. And the fourth poured out his bowl upon the sun, and it was given to it to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with fierce heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has the power over these plagues. And they did not repent, so as to give him glory. And the fifth poured out his bowl upon the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became darkened, and they gnawed their tongues because of pain, and they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. And the sixth poured out his bowl upon the great river, the Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way might be prepared for the kings from the east. Okay, if you have your outline, let's go ahead and fill in a lot of it so that none of us are lost, and then I'll go back and get the details here. All right, so on your outline, there's two major points, the bowls of wrath, all right? 
This is not a spectator sport, but everybody here will be involved in it and they will hate it. This is the inhabitants of the earth. At this point, it is more or less the unsaved that are on the earth. By and large, the saved are already gone. Let's now fill in the blanks under letter A. As we've read, could this be what it's described right in germ warfare? I mean, think of COVID. Will this be COVID on an excruciating extended level that we can't even scratch the surface as bad as COVID has been? Or letter B, could it be nuclear warfare? You could add by bodily afflictions, or you can just say it all as one. Could it be letter B, nuclear warfare, bodily afflictions? This is the verses that we read. I'm, re I'm going on. So these, I'm reading now the pure, really it should be the putrefying, not purifying, although God has a purifying purpose, and I misspelled that one. The sores are worse than any cancer or leprosy. Number two under B, right in God is revealing or allowing physically in judgment what man is morally, and put a colon there, that was omitted, under, after morally put a colon. In other words, God is allowing physically in judgment what man is morally, that is utterly corrupt. Number three, and you probably have already seen this, this compares to the sixth plague in Egypt. All of these things really parallel the plagues going back to the day of Moses. It's the sixth plague. That's like the boil sore. Remember, remember Satan was allowed to afflict Job with what? Boils. I've had them. They are very, very painful. All right. Now, let us see. Remember the second bowl from the second angel. And by the way, here it's more severe than the second trumpet. Remember when we read about the second trump trumpet, one third of the sea was poison. Now it appears that it is the total sea, right in sea. The total sea is completely poisoned. Letter three, number three, excuse me, under letter C. The sea is the great Reservoir in life, it is. This is why it will devastate all activity and commerce. It's the great reservoir of life. Number four, this will show us we are dependent on God for everything. We are dependent on God for everything. Letter D, because God is righteous in his judgments, but he's also a God of mercy upon believers. Letter E, God brings judgment on those, those that killed the saints and the prophets and killed all these people, became martyrs. Now they are going to experience the wrath for the wrath that they've poured out. So letter F now, the fourth angel pours out his bowl on the sun, number one under F. There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. Stop and think about that. There'll be, by the way, on, on the creation week, on day one, he, create, he, made the, he fixed his attention on earth. He didn't really, he didn't create all the other stuff in the universe till day four. Think about that. God fixed his attention on this little planet earth where we would inhabit it. Not only is God bringing judgment on the wicked inhabitants of the earth, he's bringing judgment on the earth, the one that he fixed his special attention on day one before he did all the other expanse in the whole universe. It's a fascinating thought when you think about that. So, I'll go back to those verses under two letters, letter F, number three. All the Lord will have to do is to remove one or two layers of atmosphere. And we'll see that. It's all he has to do. And yet, in spite of this, does man repent with all these judgments? No, mankind blasphemes God who had the power over these plagues. They, they did not repent or give God glory. Number five, under letter F, the human heart is incurable without God to change it or to convert it, whatever one you prefer. The human heart is incurable without God to change it. Letter G, the fifth angel pours out his bowl upon the throne of the beast. That's, the, of course, the Antichrist. We see, as we've read, the sun's wattage is increased. The heat is greater, but the light is less. I wonder what all, if there's weathermen, what they'll be saying about it then with global warming, but this will be something that has never happened before. It is like the ninth, and, but yet there's less light. It's like the ninth plague of Egypt, darkness. Number four under G, John is stating where all these prophecies fit in. The great tribulation 
and the end of it, the great tribulation. All right, one final point as we, before we stop the outline for now. Under F, under H, the sixth angel pours out his bowl in the great river Euphrates. That's the border between right in the east and the west. It flows 1,800 miles. It is deep and it is wide. All right? So the people will choose, they've already chosen the Antichrist to be their leader. They will move across the Euphrates with hundreds of millions into the land of Palestine. This is the last and final great conflict on the earth. All right, so there's the outline. Now I want to fill it in so nobody should be lost till we get to the second point in, in terms of the outline. Let's go back now and look at some details. Remember, history is his story. History is his story. And yet, not only the past, but this is the future. So Jesus is the one marching to victory. It is not going to be up to some official to decide which call is right. Do we have to go back to instant replay? No. God is calling the shots. Jesus is in charge. He's moving his army to victory. The Father has commanded all judgment to the Son. And so these seven angels execute the command. Now again, it might be difficult for some of us, um, us to envision God pouring out his wrath. But stop and think about this. He's already sent the 144,000. They're witnessing. They're talking about the gospel. Remember, then there was that great company of Gentiles that were saved. They're sharing the gospel. Then there was the two witnesses that did it. Then there was the angel flying in heaven. Nobody could miss the, the message to repent. They heard it over and over. And they hardened their heart. And now it is time for judgment. The, the, the mantle has been laid down, and now God is bringing down judgment. So, and by the way, you know, and I, this is the lesson to all of us, even now, and I have found myself more there than I care to admit, but for some of us, we hold on very tightly to the things of the earth, do we not? It's all passing away, is it not? But sometimes we can get so, and how do you know when you're there? If you find yourself so fixated about something, very upset, angry, impatient, or you're holding on tightly to something, it, it's likely it's become too important to you. What is really important? Stop and think about that. What is going to pass away? It's all going to pass away. God's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. So there's a lesson even for us in that. Notice verses 1 and 2 as you're reading along there again. So remember ch chapter 15, the angels have left the mercy seat. So now they're coming to pour out judgment. Again, from the outline, is this germ warfare? Is COVID merely a taste? And by the way, as I've been going through Joel, we don't, Joel and the prophets had the right to say, this is from God. We're not prophets. So we cannot really pronounce, well, this is from God or that's from God. That's not our ability or our authority. But there could be things that, in a sense, or a, a foreshadowing, a word picture of that. And I want to ask you, I'm going to ask my Sunday school class, what have you personally learned through the pandemic? Have you learned something? What do you think God wants us to learn as a church, as a people? It's been tough, hasn't it? What has God taught you through the pandemic? It's been tough, hasn't it? What have you learned? What do you think God wants us to learn from this? Has there any, been anything like this before? Not in that, this sense, is there? It's amazing, really. But could it be germ warfare? Either that mankind does to each other, because I got all the people are still sending me stuff, Ebola and the AIDS and all this stuff, it's in the lab, it's in, you know, you get all this stuff. But is it, or is it gonna be something God directly brings down upon mankind? Or could it be nuclear warfare? If not man nuking each other, is God gonna do more or less the equivalent where you have the nuclear warfare fallout, including these sores and everything that's going on? So stop and think about that. And these sores, as I said, are very, very painful. So God's allowing physically what man is morally corrupt. Now, again, this compares to the sixth plague in Egypt. And I've talked about that. By the way, if you notice your outline, I have those verses there. Moses actually predicted this for people. Remember, they went out from the land of Egypt. Not everybody was a believer. Some of the, even the Egyptians went to just get out of there. And so if they were not going to adhere to God... And the law that God gave, this is what Moses said. You can read it later. Deuteronomy 28, I'm reading now. Moses said, but it will come about. If you do not obey the Lord your God, they're under the law now. You obey blessing. If you disobey, judgment. If you don't observe all of his commandments and his statutes, which I charge you today, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Here's a list of them. The Lord will smite you with the boils of Egypt 
and tumors and the scab and the itch from which you cannot be healed. Verse 35, the Lord will strike you on your knees and your legs with sore boils from which you cannot be healed from the sole of your foot to the crown of your head. I mean, there was judgment. It's severe if you didn't obey God under the, under the law. Moses predicted that. And yet the ultimate fulfillment is here. Notice who this comes upon. It comes upon, notice verse 2, who does it come upon? Those that, what, take the mark and worship the beast. These are the ones. They have turned their allegiance to the false antichrist and the false prophet and ultimately Satan. So that's what will happen to them there. Notice verse 3. This is the second bowl, and again, it's more severe than the second trumpet because now the total sea has become like the blood of a dead man. So it meant the sea is the great you know, reservoir of life. So if the fish are poisoned, and now man eats the fish, what's going to happen? He's going to receive all the poisonous results of that. The sea, formerly teeming with life, now becomes the place of death. And the stench from all these bloody carcasses will be floating on the water. Commerce will be absolutely paralyzed. And human beings die like flies. Man. God said the life of the flesh is what? In the blood. But in this plague, blood is the token of death. The sea becomes the grave of death rather than the womb of life. So the first plague in Egypt was what? Turning the Nile River into what? Blood. Because that's where all the Egyptians, all their gods were worshipped there. The crocodile, the frogs. Everything was sacred in their Nile. Their, their means of life was from that. And so God brought judgment on their gods. And you see the similarity here. So we are dependent on God for everything. As somebody said, you and I pay the bills for the water and the light and the gas companies, we pay them, right? But, you know, where did they get the light and the gas and the water? Has God ever sent us a bill for the sunshine or the rain that we get or the air we breathe? If he did, do you think you and I could pay him? No, we're dependent on God. But he's so gracious to us. Even to this God-rejecting world, he's extended mercy and the salvation message over and over. And now the angels pour out the bowls of wrath. God has assigned angels, by the way, to various departments of supervision. You had the, the angels that were in charge of the four winds of the earth, and God's got a water control angel here too. And that's what's going on. So this angel, notice now what he says in verse 5. God is not unrighteous. The angel says he's righteous in what he does. And notice it says, uh, verse 7, and I heard the altar. It's not literally the altar speaking, but it's those that are there that were martyrs, that are worshiping at the altar. It's the martyred saints. And they are saying, yes, God is righteous and just, and we have been murdered and abolished from the earth, but God is bringing judgment upon those who did that to us. So God is righteous in everything he does. It's poetic justice for those that killed God's saints during this time. And as I said, in my estimation, at this point, it is the earth dwellers. It is basically a world of all unbelievers. In Noah's day, who was righteous in Noah's day? Basically, Noah and his family, right? The whole rest of the earth was what? Filled with violence and unbelievers. It will be the same here, the same situation. No wonder, Jesus said, unless those days were shortened, what? No flesh would be saved. Mm. Verse 6, notice verse 6. God brings judgment, on, as they said, on those who poured out the saints' blood. Now, verse 8. This is interesting if we go to verse 8. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun. Our own sun. When you look at the stars tonight, they're all distant suns. But it's now the sun of our solar system. And, and by the way, Jesus said in Luke, the, one, the disciples said, when's going to be the end of the age? He didn't talk about the church age. He didn't even talk about the cross or the rapture. He said the ultimate is this time. It'll be like nothing else that has ever happened. When he sets up the abomination of desolation and you see signs in the heavens, you will know it is the end. It is the final end. Jesus there said there will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars, and the earth will be in disarray among the nations. Now, notice the verse there. You can look it up later on your outline. Deuteronomy 32, 24. Even though Moses said this, the ultimate fulfillment 
is here. Listen carefully. There will, they will be wasted by famine and consumed by burning heat and bitter destruction. This is the ultimate fulfillment. And the teeth of beast will I send upon them and the venom of crawling things of the dust. Even the animal kingdom will turn on mankind during this last time. Isaiah 24, verse 6, Therefore a curse devours the earth. When has a curse ever devoured the entire earth? It has not yet happened. Israel is really cursed today. It was a land of milk and honey. Do you know what it looks like today? It is barren over there. It's not a land of milk and honey. It once was. It will be again. It is barren, desolate, because God brought judgment upon that land. But not the whole earth. Here, the, Isaiah says, it is coming. The whole earth will be cursed. And those who live in it will be held guilty, says Isaiah. The inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few are left. Isaiah 24, verse 6. Malachi, chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, an oven, and all the arrogant, and every evildoer will be shaft. And that day is coming, and they will be set ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that there will be neither root nor branch. But for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness will arise with healing in his wings, and you will go forth and skip like calves out of the stall. And you will tread down the wicked, and they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet for the day which I am preparing, says the Lord of hosts. What a contrast between the righteous and the unrighteous. And now look at it, as I said in your outline, all the Lord has to do is just strip back one or two layers of atmosphere, and boom, the whole place will heat up. He will either pull the earth toward the sun or just tilt the earth a little bit on its axis, and that's all God has to do to have these conditions come about. And yet, notice verse 9, in spite of all this, what does men do? Do they repent? No, when judgment's coming, they're shaking their fist at God in anger and blaspheming God. He has power over, but they don't repent. The human heart is incurable. God alone can change it. No amount of punishment will change that. The great tribulation is not for the purification of the church. That's not stated anywhere. Nowhere is it said the saints are purified by the great tribulation. It is a judgment on the earth and the earth dwellers, the unbelievers. Now, verses 10 and 11, we come to the fifth angel. And now the inflictions upon the Antichrist, he has, remember Revelation 13? It's the man and it's his kingdom. His whole kingdom now is darkened. Think about this, the sun's wattage is increased, the heat is greater, but the irony, the light is less. Just like that ninth plague in Egypt, darkness, darkness. Joel, the ultimate fulfillment of Joel 2.1 is this, for the day is coming, surely it is near, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Now, we began our day what? At sunrise. You know how the Hebrews began it? At sunset. Remember Genesis evening and morning? Remember that? God always starts it with evening and morning. That's the way the Jewish mind thought. The day of the Lord begins with a day of darkness. Joel is talking about this time period. That's why you can't just yank something out of Scripture and make it stand by itself. It all fits together. All right? John is telling us where these prophecies fit in. The great tribulation. And man in his deep depravity does not turn to God. So you say, well, we might as well give up. No. Word of witness, because who converts the heart? The Holy Spirit, right? We can plant the seed and share the word. And by the way, there was great revival going on during that time. McGee says like there will be like never before. And yet here at the ultimate end, they're gone and the earth dwellers are the unbelievers. So man is now going to experience this. God is the judge. Christ is handing out the punishment. Remember what Paul said, do, do not despise the goodness and forbearance of God, knowing not what? That the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. It should. Revelation 16 now, verse 12. Now let's go to the second. This is the second point now, and this is Armageddon. Even the world knows that term, do they not? If you, if you ask somebody in the world, oh yeah, they know. They've heard that term. What exactly is meant here? So let's go back to your outline now, number two. So this is the interlude between the sixth and the seventh bowl. This is not halftime with the marching band. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. So Armageddon 
is not a single battle, but a war. Really the last three and a half years. Some scholars see it as the final battle. It's really both and. But it's not just a single battle, it's a war. And by the way, it's not Darth Vader and Obi-Wan Kenobi where there's equal forces. No, God's in charge. They're all his created beings. God's not going down in defeat here. Number C, it is the, what we have, and I'm going to read before it, so let me read these verses now. We'll, verse 13, follow along. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits, notice the comparison, like frogs. For they are the spirits of demons, performing signs, which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God, the Almighty. Behold, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his garments, lest he walk about naked and men see his shame. And they gather them together in the place which in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Now, let's go back to the outline. So again, this is not a, not, this is not a single battle, but a war. This is the trinity of hell. Let her see, Satan, right in, Antichrist, and the false prophet. It's the unholy trinity. Satan, Antichrist, and the false prophet. They act in unison, enforcing, or we could say convincing the nations of the world, its leaders, to try to overthrow God's purposes on the earth. The frogs is a symbol, all right? Go on to page two. Because, you know, they continually croaked. God brought them, well, he brought the flies or the gnats and the frogs upon the Egyptians. Remember that? I got a funny quick story. You know, some of you grew up in Pitt County. I don't know if, if I were you, I'd, I'd find myself sometimes depressed because all the land and farmland, it's been just, so many things have changed. I remember 1980, I was taking piano lessons and there was a pond. I can't even remember where it was, but I'm sure it's all built up now. But when my brother was doing his part, there was the pond, and I went down to the pond. There was this little tiny pier, and I saw something stand up out of the water, and I thought it was a little turtle. I wouldn't do this now, but I took a stick, and I started going, pff, 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 on. thought I was popping the turtle's shell, and that was not the turtle's shell. I found out it was the head, and boom, up comes this humongous snapping turtle. Man. It was so big, I let my stick go, and I flew out of there, man. I was scared to death. It was kind of like Brody with Jaws throwing the fish over, and boom, he comes up. We're going to need a bigger boat, you know? Well, here, the, these frogs, I mean, it's not just a literal frog. This is far worse. It is, it's a picture of demons and what they're doing. And it's a horrific scene of what is coming on the earth. We did a Bible study the other night in Zoom. And remember, Jesus sent out the disciples two by two, and he gave them power what to cast out demons and to heal the sick. And we were talking all about the, the, uh, the applications with that. A lot of interesting parallels. But notice now, so on your outline, so number two, the, the activity of Satan is continuous, like the croaking of frogs. Here we have letter three, number three, evil spirits that attempt to abolish God from the earth. Now I got competition, so we'll have to tune in your ears. All right. Go back to number two. The activity of Satan is continuous. All right. And by the way, during this final day, there will be no fire alarm to set off God's judgment. They will come down quick. All right, number three, in case you missed it. Thank you, David. Here we have evil spirits that attempt to abolish God from the earth. Now, letter F. This is important. The Lord will come as a thief. Now, somebody says, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Maybe we've got it all wrong. So maybe it's the, real, the real belief is post-tribulation. In other words, the church is going to go all the way through the tribulation, and then this doesn't say he comes as a thief of the church, and then we go up. Is that what it's saying? No. Remember the, remember the guy that was the, thought the two witnesses were the church, and so the church goes halfway through the tribulation, and then they go up, and then there's the post-trib view, that's this view, that the church is all the way to the end. No. What is the view Carney and I have been teaching? Pre-trib, the church is taken out before the tribulation. You don't hear the word church after chapter 3. And by the way, uh, that's why when you get to Revelation 17 and it talks about Babylon, I do not call Babylon the false church. I call it a false religious organization because it's comprised. I don't call it the church because John does not mention the word church again until chapter 19. I think there's a purpose in that. 
You don't see the church, the church is not there, it's gone. I please, I hope you understand that. So, well, what does he mean here? That he's coming as a thief. So let's talk about that. Number one, under F, fill in. The Lord will not come for the church as a thief. Letter F, the Lord will come as a thief, yes. But number one, the Lord will not come for the church as a thief. All right, and I'm going to read now, as we're coming to this portion, uh, about that. So, um, got to find my place in the outline here. All right, so now let's go back to this verse, and I'm going to break it down. So, as we've looked at verses 10 and 11 and the judgments that are coming, now we come to Armageddon, so this is what's talking about. This is the interlude between the sixth and the seventh bowl, okay? So, what does it mean that he's coming as a thief? He's not coming for the church as a thief. Listen to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 4. But you, brethren, are not in darkness. The world here is in darkness. You're not in darkness, but what? In the light, that the day should not overtake you like a thief. You are all sons and daughters of light, sons of the day. We are not of the night of the darkness. So that's what Paul says. So a thief is not somebody that you welcome, all right? Is the church to look for the thief? No, the church is to look for what? The blessed hope, 1 Timothy 1.1. The blessed hope is Jesus Christ. That's who we're looking for. All right? We don't welcome a thief. You don't put a note on your door, Mr. Thief, I've turned my security off. The back door is open. Help yourself. The silver is in the second drawer and all the goods are in the bedroom. Help yourself. Is that what we say? No, you want to lock a thief out. Here's what the point in context of what he's saying. The world wants to shut the Lord out like a thief. They do not want him coming back. They've already blasphemed him. They're shaking their fist at God. They don't want him to come back to the earth, but it's his earth. So do you see the point? The world wants to treat him like a thief and keep him, keep him out, but he's coming back. To them, it's like a thief. To us, he's the blessed hope. Do you get that point? So to the world, yes. Oh, he's coming like a thief. We don't want him. Stay out. It's our world. We're in charge now. The Antichrist is our God. See the point? But he's still coming back. And so the world would like to shut him out. And by, what does he mean, keep your garments on? Now, some of you, anybody in the military, do you ever have to keep guard? I don't know if you ever do that, Mitch, or not. But uh, this is the picture in that day. This is what the Lord is saying. In that day, according to tradition, the captain of the guard would make his rounds to see if any of the guards were asleep on the job. If the guards were caught asleep, they were beaten with a stick and their garments were set on fire. And then you'd have to be the stalker and walk home naked and everybody would see your shame. That was actually the tradition around the temple. It sounds rather harsh, doesn't it? But, you know, what, it, what does it say in Ephesians? Paul says, wake up, sleeper, and let Christ shine. Remember that song we sing, wake up, O sleeper? Well, that's the point. You know, and what is it? Are we going to have to wear, are we going to have to make it on our own righteous acts? No, what God is saying is the only way you and I can make it is to be clothed in the righteous robes of Jesus Christ. We are accepted in him. That's the only way. But he's telling the people in that day, you better repent or else you're asleep, you're dead spiritually, and you're going to go up. So there's going to be judgment. That's the analogy there. So John is saying, don't lose your shirt. And if your shirt was caught in fire, you let it go. So be sure you're clothed with the righteousness of Christ. Armageddon. Some scholars do believe it's the final battle. It's really the final three years. Now, verse 15, this is the only time you see Armageddon translated from the Hebrew text here, spelled like that in Scripture. It is the fertile plain. It is the final football bowl, and it is God bringing judgment upon the unbelievers. It is the gridiron, but it is not God versus Satan. And made, you know, well, this is up for grabs. No, it's not at all. And here's the point of that verse. So, and many, think about all the famous people that have come there. Nebuchadnezzar was there. The Assyrians came there. Napoleon fought there. Uh, the Christian crusaders that were there. The anti-Christian Frenchmen were there. The Egyptians, the Persians, the Turks, the Arabs. It's there that King Saul died. It's there that King Josiah was killed by an Egyptian uh, uh, pharaoh. So it was a place of battle, for sure. And yet the final battle there is yet to come. Now notice verses 17 and 18. 
So I hope we're caught up on the outline. Yes, we're getting, let's go letter G. Now the seventh angel pours out his bowl on the air, and he says, it is done. Jesus said, and by the way, chapter 15 last week, it began with, it is done, and it ended, it is done. When Jesus died on the cross, he said, it is finished. The price has been paid. God is not willing that any should perish. Why do you think he's waited 2,000 and plus years? He's waiting for people to repent. Never question the mercy and compassion and grace of God. He's been waiting for mankind to repent and to be saved. But here, man is shaking his fist at God. So the, number two under letter G, we're at the, at the very end of the great tribulation. Number three, write in, the Lord controls space. It's his universe. You ought to, by the way, I, I encourage you, I've been, watched the DVD on fractals by Dr. Lyle, and so many of them that are in the library, you ought to get them. They're just, at, he just couldn't cover all this when he was here. Fascinating things about uh, astronomy, and just, I can't even begin to talk about it. It's really worth your time. That now I'm reading on, so we're down to number four, but let me read now, verse 17. And the seventh angel poured out his bowl upon the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds of peals of thunder. That's always the sounds of judgment. And there was a great earthquake, such as there has not been since man was upon the earth. How does that grab you? An earthquake like has, now think about all the civilizations, Atlantis, the lost continent, all those Greek cities that are under the sea, all these earthquakes that we read about in history. This is an earthquake, not like San Francisco. I mean like no other earthquake. God is literally going to shake the earth with this earthquake like none has ever been seen before. It was so great and so mighty. Verse 19, and the great city was split into three parts and the cities of the nations fell and Babylon the great was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of his fierce wrath. And verse 20, and every island fled away and the mountains were not found and huge hailstones about 100 pounds each came down from heaven upon men, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, because its plague was extremely severe. What a way to end the chapter with man still in rebellion. So, now we're at the great earthquake. Now, let me break this down. Some believe that it is Babylon because Babylon is mentioned. Some believe it is Rome because they believe in a revived Roman Empire. I believe it, no other Jew would call any city great than what? Jerusalem. So I believe it is Jerusalem. It, doesn't, it starts there, but it goes to the entire earth. God is literally shaking the earth in an earthquake like never seen before. And stop and think about this. And, and again, they, they, you know, and I'm going to make a comparison here that I think is very important. No geographical location is given in this verse, but the Lord controls space. The temple is mentioned over and over in, in, the, in this book. And the reason is because we're, we're being identified with the people that had an association with the temple. We're not, we are the temple. We don't have an association with it, but those people did. It is the nation Israel that is associated with the temple. They will go through the great tribulation period. Most, not all, but most of the nation. They will look upon the one whom they've pierced. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. So most will turn. You have the 144,000 out of the tribes that will be saved. They're going to be sealed. They're going to make it through the great company of Gentiles. They will make it through. Those are the only two groups that are sealed. Everybody else will perish. There'll be great martyrs of believers, and then the unbelievers will perish. God is going to do this. The church, like Enoch, was taken. Enoch was what? Translated, taken up. The church is not going to be here. Enoch did not enter the time of the judgment of the flood. He was taken up. Noah did. Noah went, he was preserved. He went through the flood, right? God saved some people in the tribulation by taking them out of the world like he did Enoch and saving them, right? But he also preserved some people, 144,000, like he preserved Noah through the flood. So God will save people in the great tribulation, but it's not for the church. They've already left the earth. When Jesus died on the cross, he said, it is finished. Now he says, it is done. 
How can we escape if we neglect so great salvation, said the Hebrew writer. Now, let's talk about this earthquake really quickly. So it is a horrendous, horrific earthquake, and the whole world will, will feel the result of it. By the way, when it says the islands fled, can you imagine the tsunamis, the mega tsunamis that will be triggered by this? And they, the whole sea has already been poisoned. Can you imagine the effect of this? This is what happens when islands hit and go in. Study history on this. By the way, this actually, there's a parallel in Joshua that happened in the Old Testament, Joshua 10. The Lord, but to the hailstones, the Lord threw large stones from heaven on them as far as Azira, and they died. There were more that died from the hailstones than from those from the sons of Israel that were killed with the sword. So there was a parallel in Joshua's day, but nothing like this. Have you ever experienced hail here before, a, you know, a tornado? And they, just, Can you imagine? And by the way, this is what you're to write in. How big are these hailstones, all right? So letter E under number four of the great earthquake, the Jewish talent was 56 pounds, write in. I mean, that's the Greek talent, excuse me. The Greek talent was 56 pounds. The Jewish talent was 114 pounds. That's how much each hailstone weighs. Can you imagine God hurling these kind of things toward the earth? Letter G, according to the, uh, the historian Josephus, a first century historian, not a believer, by the way, but a great historian, the Roman army under the general Titus had catapults that threw stones that size into Jerusalem when they overtook the city. Of course, that's the preterist view of Revelation, that it's all past, all right? So as we come to, this is the end of the tribulation. God is bringing judgment upon the earth. That's why I said as you move into chapter 17, he fixes his attention on commercial Babylon and religious Babylon. It's definitely... Not, not the church. It is a false religious organization. Let's look at a couple of footnotes that I have there for you on your outline. In the French Revolution, there was described a foul, a foul and loathsome sore during the, that time, and it really was a, a picture of that time of moral corruption, atheism, and general disillusion in society. But that's a picture of what is going on here. All right? Say, well, what about some of these countries like China that are atheistic? They will still embrace the one human leader that says, I am your human God. They will embrace him. The religions of the world will come together. Commentator Barnes there says that the sore is like an ulcer or a boil uh, of painful care. Even if you had kidney stones or gall stones, you can just imagine the kind of pain that will not be taken away from these people. Hal Lindsey is our nuclear guy. He says that the, and I think this is all in play, the rash of these malignant sores that were described could be easily caused by the tremendous radioactive pollution in the atmosphere. I think definitely. If man doesn't do it to himself, God will bring down the equivalent of nuclear warfare and the effects of it on mankind, right? After the bombings of Nagasaki and Hiroshima, thousands of people developed hideous sores because of the radioactivity. Ironside, that old scholar says, it's a, a spiritual and literal fulfillment. I'm quoting him, what a scene of death and desolation, whether we think of it as physical or spiritual or both. I think all are in play. The sun is affected. How Lindsay says, you know, if you have a full scale nuclear exchange, that is going to radically upset the balance of the atmosphere, to be sure. I think all of it's in play. It's literal. And if you have signs like the frogs, the signs are a symbol of something far worse. So that great city, Jerusalem, will be affected. And yet, uh, you know, by the way, in closing, so we just don't completely end on a totally negative note. God is going to renew the whole earth. And I want you to go back to Isaiah. In the millennial kingdom, I hope I've got the chapter right. Let's go back to Isaiah. I'm going to go verse 2. I think chapter 11 there, yes, this is what it's going to be when God totally renews the heavens and the earth. New heavens, a new earth, so when the whole judgment is done and finished and it goes up in a big ball of fire, not like the worldwide flood, but when, now what will it look like then in the future? It says, and this will be, and this is a picture of Christ, but it's also a picture of the millennial kingdom. The Spirit of God will rest upon him, and notice now, here's the conditions. Go down to verse 6, all right? 
So you have a description of Christ, but notice verse six. This is the picture of the millennial kingdom. And the wolf will dwell with the lamb. Do you see that today? You, you'll, you will then. And the leopard will lie down with the kid and the calf and the young lion and the faddling together. You do not see that today, do you? It, you will in the millennial kingdom. And a little boy will lead them. And the cow and the bear will graze and the young will lie down together and the lion will eat straw like an ox. And the nursing child will play with the hole of the cobra. And the weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den. And they will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. What a picture. What a picture. And go over to Isaiah chapter 59. So in the millennial kingdom, it'll be a renewed paradise like Eden, it will be renewed all over again. Can you imagine out of all this destruction, God is going to bring complete renewal, all right? And by the way, if you have felt pains in your body and you don't like the aging that's going on and we grieve with disease and death, God's got renewal. He's got a resurrection body for us, amen? The future is the best. God always saves the last for the best. Now notice Isaiah and... Um, I think it's chapter 65. Yeah, I want to go there and then we'll close, all right? Verse 17 of Isaiah, chapter 65. Here's the new heavens and the new earth. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. So you even think about, I'm going to go to heaven. Now even heaven's going to be changed and renewed. And the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem for rejoicing and the people for gladness. God wants joy. He, doesn't, he never set up a feast for fasting. He set up a supper feast. He wants his people to rejoice. And notice now, uh, there will no longer, verse 19, be heard and heard the voice of weeping, the sound of crying. No longer will there be an infant who lives only a few days and an old man who does not live out his days. For if a youth will die at the age of 100, he will, and let me read that again, for the youth will die at the age of 100, and the one who does not reach the age of 100 shall be called a curse. In other words, people are going to live very long, long lives again. And the millennial king, that's how the earth is going to be repopulated. So God's got great renewal for us in these days. So that's just a few things that God has for us. And he says the same thing down at verse 25 as I'm closing. And it says, The wolf and the lamb will graze together, and the lion will eat straw like an ox. And dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not do harm or evil in all my holy mountain, says the, the Lord. You know, when Adam sinned, everything under his provision was accursed, including the animal kingdom. Because when God made provision with them with skins, what did God? God was the one that initiated animal sacrifice. All the earth was affected by man's sin. And yet, the second Adam is going to renew everything and everything is going to be a renewed paradise and you and I are going to be part of that paradise. This is the hope. This is the message that we can share with the world. Yes, they need to repent, but a great day is coming. God's in charge. And he's going to renew everything. He's renewing us daily. He renews us daily in his word. Amen. Let's stand together and I'll close tonight. Dear Lord, it is a sobering chapter. It, it, yet it reminds us you're in charge, you're in control, nothing escapes your attention. You're, and it says the Lord watches over us, Psalm 120, 121. He watches over us day and night. You watch over each of us. You care for us. You love us. You, you clothe us with the robes of Jesus Christ. You meet our needs. Thank you, Lord, that this Christmas season we can think about God became a human being because we could only be redeemed by a relative, a kinsman redeemer, one who took on flesh, who died in our place, the perfect one, so that we could have eternal life with you forever and ever. You became poor so that we could become rich in your sight forever. We exalt your name and we glorify you tonight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You are dismissed.